Representing the City of Santa Cruz and Soquel Creek Water District, the proponents of a seawater desalination project are Mike Rotkin and Toby Goddard. The name of their team, the initials SCWD squared, or squid squared as they refer to themselves, denotes the joint venture between the City of Santa Cruz Water Department and Soquel Creek Water District as they share the same initials. Dr. Mike Rotkin served six terms on the Santa Cruz City Council between 1979 and 2010, five times as mayor. During this time, Mike was active in the city's water and infrastructure issues, as well as the creation of the city's green belt and the expansion of human services. Mike is a lecturer and director of the field study program in community studies at UCSC, where he has worked since 1969. Mike has served on the boards of local nonprofits, including the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, Food and Nutrition Incorporated, and the American Civil Liberties Union. Mr. Toby Goddard has over 30 years professional experience in the field of water resources, including 16 years as the water conservation manager for the City of Santa Cruz Water Department, seven years as a resource planner for county government, and seven years as a water quality scientist oceanographer for an environmental consulting firm. He is a, a member of the American Water Works Association and serves as the city's representative on the California Urban Water Conservation Council. Toby is also an elected member of the Santa Cruz Port Commission. Representing desal alternatives, advocates for alternatives to a desalination plant are James Bentley and Rick Longinotti. Mr. James Bentley has 28 years of experience in water and wastewater management and operation. He worked for the City of Santa Cruz Water Department in the production section from 1993 to 2008, including 14 years as superintendent of water plant and production. He holds California Department of Public Health's highest certifications in water treatment and water distribution and is a grade three wastewater treatment operator. Mr. Rick Longinotti is a former electrical contractor and currently a marriage and family therapist. He co-founded Santa Cruz Desal Alternatives and publishes information about conservation-based alternatives, alternatives to desalination. Rick has co-founded other nonprofits such as Nonviolent Communication Santa Cruz, Transition Santa Cruz, and Sojourn Middle School. He has lived in Santa Cruz since 1989 with his wife Aviva and two children. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for tonight's debate, Ms. Kirsten Liskey. Good evening, neighbors. It's a gorgeous evening, and I'm feeling really grateful for the opportunity to be here with you. I'm wondering if any of you are feeling the same way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Every era has its defining uh, questions and choices that really define it and distinguish it from others. One of the defining questions for our time is how we will steward the natural resources of this planet. To respond well, we need to continue to improve as a community, as a nation, and as a planet, um, the ability to courteously and comprehensively hear all sides of the issue so that the most fruitful collaboration of solutions can be selected for action. Tonight, under the helpful structure of the League of Women Voters debate format, we'll do just that. We will both inquire and listen with care and look for the intent behind the diverse thinking about a key issue for our community and the West, which is the pursuit of desalination for new local water supply. My role here this evening as moderator is to captain the timeline, to articulate the questions for the teams, and to break out my large stage hook if any of them ignore our timekeepers. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge our timekeepers, uh, Pam Newberry and Sandy Warren. Thank you. The format for the evening has three main components. I just want to give you an orientation. First, each team will have 10 minutes to provide opening remarks. Second, the teams will respond to three prepared questions that were submitted by the opposing team. And third, the teams will respond to questions submitted from the audience. Each team will be offered a two-minute closing statement opportunity. Uh, for the audience to submit a question, please write one question on each question and answer card and then pass the completed cards down to the volunteers who will be staffing the aisles. I don't know where they're at. Maybe they can raise their hands. 
they're waving, they're in the back, they'll be, you just kind of pass them to the end of the row and the row person can flag them down, they'll come pick them up. Um, so do we have your agreement as an audience as to how you'll participate this evening? Great, thank you. And as they arrive this evening, the team uh, we thought was going to draw straws, but drew numbers instead. And Decel Alternatives uh, drew the slot for team number one, so they will provide the first opening remarks. To help the presenters to stay in time, our timekeepers will hold up a green card indicating one minute is remaining, a yellow card indicating 30 seconds remaining, and a red card indicating that time is up. We, would, we don't want to cut you off from your sentence, so once you see the red card, just complete that sentence um, as quickly as you can. Thank you. Um, as moderator, I also reserve the right to call a five-minute timeout should we need it for any reason. Teams, do you understand the timekeeper cues and agree to the format? Great. Thank you. So with that, DSAL Alternatives, you now have 10 minutes to provide your opening remarks. So what I want to talk about is the environmental and financial costs of the DSAL plan and also present you with some of the alternatives. The environmental costs are, have to do with the energy use and greenhouse gas consumption, also marine impacts, and there's issues about water quality and safety. The, the last two, I won't have time to talk about this opening presentation, so I hope you ask questions about that. This is a slide that um, shows the comparison of the energy use required for desalinization compared to our current energy use. So it's 13 times the amount of power, electrical power, to desalinate a gallon of water as what we can do right now. So for some of you, this slide is all you need to see, and you might walk out right now. But uh, for those of you who, who are staying around, I'll continue. The electricity is going to come from PG&E. Uh, there's a disproportionate amount of power that is going to be supplied by coal-fired plants from out of state for everything that gets added to the grid. In other words, in the peak use season, in the summer season, if you're adding, if you're adding a load to the PG&E grid, it's going to come from places like the Navajo Indian Reservation, where those people get to breathe the, uh, the gases. Why is there a proposal to choose a water supply strategy that's so energy intensive? This is not a really a great time. We've got all these countries in red here that have uh, passed their peak oil production. Fossil fuel extraction is more expensive. It's more environmentally damaging. Uh, the, even the Pentagon says that by 2012, for the first time in history, we'll have uh, a period where there's uh, supply cannot meet demand, and that's not going to be reversed. So this means uh, energy prices across the board, including natural gas, will be uh, spike, spiking. Even Saudi Arabia is concerned with the energy consumption of their desal plant. If we're going to consider a water supply strategy, we've got to include all these kinds of things. We've got to include the greenhouse gas emissions costs, the, uh, the dollars leaving our community to pay for energy. This is people's discretionary income. This is what would go to support local businesses, but it's not. It's going to leave the community. Um, and we've got to take into account these other costs, of the environmental costs and also the, the costs in human lives. So the obvious question is, why not use renewable energy to power the plant? The answer, according to the environmental impact report for the uh, integrated water plan, which considered desalination, was that it's not feasible. These sources are not feasible at this time for power requirements typical of large-scale industrial type applications. And the reason mainly is cost. Let me take you through this example. The water department put on uh, their Graham Hill water treatment plant some solar panels at a cost of 1.6 million. If we're going to run the desal plant at half capacity for the whole year, which is what Soquel Creek proposes to do, we would need 33 solar installations of that size at a cost of $53 million. It's not in the budget. So as far as I'm concerned, this was uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's finest hour when he pushed through and, and signed AB 32, which limits our greenhouse gas emissions. The goal is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to, by 80%. And that's an incredible figure, and I, I, can't, I can't even grasp that myself. How are we going to heat our homes and get around? And, you know, it's, it's incomprehensible. But that's the goal. They, the, the legislature and the governor listened to the scientists. Quite a remarkable event. The Santa Cruz City Council, of course, uh, has said that they want the desal plant to be carbon neutral. But I don't understand how they could say that because they've already ruled out using renewable energy. To me, it's impossible to make the plant carbon neutral unless you use renewable energy. Now, the problem here is that there's plenty of um, consultants that are going to want to sell you uh, on the, their ideas, 
and one of them was a consultant working for this project that said, well, buy renewable energy credits. Renewable energy credits, according to this Business Week cover story called Little Green Lies, uh, often the renewable energy credit trade seems like little more than buying and selling bragging rights rather than incentives that lead to the construction of wind turbines and solar panels. We can talk about that more later. I can explain what those are, but it really doesn't result in carbon reductions. For more information, you can contact this organization. So let's turn to costs. As recently as 2008, the estimate was $40 million to construct the desal plant. Now we're looking closer to 120 million, and our water director said the other day that it could go as high as 130 million. Looked at a different way, the cost to produce a million gallons of water from Loch Lomond is $170. Very inexpensive. Cost of desalination, according to the California Public Utilities Commission, the Monterey plant that is being proposed, $19,000 for a million gallons. It's not a typo. New technology means high cost overruns. This is Tampa Bay, Florida plant. This is the only plant in the United States that is a desalination plant for major uh, municipal use. And it's also a, a plant that uh, is using brackish water, not ocean water straight from the ocean. So we're at the cutting edge of technology. Congratulations, folks. We're, we're leading the, uh, we're the guinea pigs for desalination. In Australia, the recently they built desalination plants that have similar problems. So let's talk about who's going to pay for the plant. According to the settlement agreement between the City of Santa Cruz and the University of California, existing customers will pay for 90% of the plant, and uh, developers in UCSA will pay for 10%. I think that number ought to be reversed, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, the desal is meant to address uh, drought protection and accommodate future growth. Uh, the water demand projections in the integrated water plan was that water demand was going to climb. Okay, and the, the difference between the water, projected water demand and what a worst case drought year, which is the red line, um, that that gap would be felt by all of us in terms of summertime curtailments. Desal was meant to, to close that gap a bit, not all the way. There would still be summer curtailments, but desal was meant to, to close a portion of it. The thing that nobody anticipated was that water demand actually dropped. This, is the, this middle line is the actual water consumption in the city, and it's many times more uh, gallons than the desal could provide. But one thing you should really know is that a worst-case drought has occurred. You define worst-case drought, meaning a drought that would require curtailments of more than 25% in the summer, once in 90 years. So in essence, uh, so this is another assumption of the integrated water plan. They interviewed people, they had committees, and the, they decided that you know, we couldn't tolerate a drought where we'd curtail more than 25%. Anything under that, we could tolerate, okay? So that really means that this desal plant is, is meant for a one in 90 year event, but we have a different idea of how to prepare for that worst case drought. And there's three strategies. One is the reservoir strategy, trying to, right now we have a balance between using the reservoir in the summertime and saving the water for a drought year. And our group is, is recommending that we shift that balance towards drought security, that we use less of the reservoir in the summertime and, use it and save more of the water in the reservoir for drought. We've actually done that, in fact, in the last three years with these high figures for the reservoir at the end of the summer time. And this is, these are remarkable numbers, and they, they're a testament to people's uh, water conservation practices. We learned from the 1976-77 drought, that was the worst drought on record, that the reservoir was, in my opinion, too low at the end of the summer of 75, which was a normal rainfall year. We dropped it down to 60 percent. There wasn't enough water left in the reservoir for uh, drought years. We want to change this number. The goal of the city is 64 percent capacity at the, end of this, at the end of the dry season. We want to change it to 84%. The difference between 84% and 64% is 560 million gallons. A desal plant would be producing less than that. That strategy will not work unless we can control growth in water demand. So that's our second strategy is water neutral development. Uh, that means we would imitate SoCal Creek Water District's practice of requiring developers to offset 120% of the new demand that they create by paying into a fund that retrofits toilets in existing buildings. 
Can UCSC grow? Yes, they can if they do this kind of building where, you know, this, this building used 16 gallons for their entire water use every day. The other strategy that Jan Bentley will talk about in a minute is collaboration between districts, water from Santa Cruz to Soquel Creek in the winter, and drought, in drought years, Soquel giving us water back. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, of Desal Alternatives. We now go to the representatives from the City of Santa Cruz and Soquel Creek Water District, the SCWD2 team. You have 10 minutes for your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to the League of Women Voters for organizing this event uh, on one of arguably the most important issues facing this local community. As a council member during the last three decades, I took the lead among council members in working on infrastructure issues, and particularly water. I played a key role in killing the Zianni Dam, which would have been environmentally destructive, and also in getting, setting the city on a path towards major water conservation. We've been trying to plan alternatives that would allow us to deal with severe drought, and after three decades, we still don't have a solution in place that, upon which we've agreed. Uh, I'm no longer on the council, but as a citizen, this is what I want from the Santa Cruz City Council in terms of water planning. First of all, we have to understand that the city, unlike our opponents here, is responsible for making sure that we actually have water uh, when we need it in the amounts that are reasonable for uh, meeting our, our local demands. Um, I want the city to plan in a way that's environmentally sensitive and to bring us water at the cheapest possible rate for our customers. I want them to maximize conservation. And the city of Santa Cruz already uh, conserves at a level that makes us one of the lowest water users in the state. Our use is about half the state average per capita. Um, I want the city to, beyond conservation all the time, to require us to actually curtail our use in severe droughts. And we did an extensive study with lots of public input that determined if we try and curtail beyond the, already, the level of conservation we already have, more than 15%, we will face business failures and sanitation and lifestyle problems in people's homes. The, I'm very pleased that we live in a community where lots of people, our opponents included, are doing creative thinking about possibility for alternative ways to deal with our water problems. And I would like the city to implement every feasible idea that people come up with that actually would make a difference in this community. Um, but I don't, I don't want the city, I do not want the city to depend upon solutions for our water problems that might work or might not work. We, I want to make sure that when we find ourselves in drought conditions, and particularly severe drought conditions, that we have adequate water to maintain a lifestyle that includes gardens in our community, that allows us not to see businesses going under for lack of adequate water, and, and so forth. In most years, the city of Santa Cruz has plenty of water. Most of our water comes from the San Lorenzo River and two north coast streams. We get a little bit from a, a wells over on the east side of town. We have very limited storage capacity in Loch Lomond Reservoir. We should understand that the total reservoir holds about two-thirds of our annual uh, average need and no more. Now my opponents will focus a great deal on the question of growth and the, the uh, impacts of growth on our uh, water demands in the future. The problem is for the city of Santa Cruz and Soquel Creek, it's not a question of growth. If we face a water shortage, a drought, not of some magical proportions, but the kind of drought we actually had in this community in 1976-77, we would be facing serious uh, problems in terms of trying to meet our needs. If you look at this chart, you'll notice that we, we have a new problem we didn't have before. We now know that the federal government is going to require the city of Santa Cruz to release an additional 800, something like an additional 800 million gallons a year for uh, preservation of fish and wildlife. And we're also losing now another million gallons a year based on uh, saltwater intrusion problems on the edge of our city next to Silk Hill Creek. If we face the drought right now with no new growth, no new residents of Santa Cruz, no new businesses, no university growth, we would be forced to cut back on our water use, to, to uh, ration our water use beyond our current conservation an additional 30 to 40 percent beyond what it is right now, based on the fact that we're going to lose these sources of water in the future. What does it mean to have to get rid, to, to cut back 30 or 40 percent? The first thing is, there would be no outdoor watering with city water, none. 
That means not just let your lawn die, but no gardens and even perhaps fruit trees and other, other trees might die under those conditions. Then you have to go inside the house, and inside where we already have low flush toilets, low water use um, appliances, people have uh, cut back in significant ways, we'd have to cut another 10 to 20% of our use. And if you have to do that, remember, having done all these things already, we're going to be in a situation where we simply don't have the ability to do what we did in 76. You cannot put a brick in a low flow toilet. It won't flush the stuff that it needs to be flushed. So we'll be facing serious sanitation problems and health and safety issues if we have to do this kind of thing. As a city, um, we've maximized our conservation programs. We think we can still do more. We're going to continue to work on that. But realistically, we're not one of the Southern California cities where nobody's conserving water. Again, we're one of the lowest water use cities in the state, and we're using half of the average amount of water the state uses. So we found um, that we try to figure out where else can we get an additional water supply so we don't have these drastic conditions that I was just talking about. We've studied every possible uh, alternative, drilled for wells, for water, try to think about raising the Loch Lomond uh, Dam, the height of it. Uh, capture water under the San Lorenzo River, every technological possible alternative we've got, and we've worked on increasing our, our conservation. We really have not come up with any alternative. I started off as an opponent to desalination. I was completely opposed to it, and I worked really hard over the last 30 years trying to find some alternative to it that would allow us not to be caught in a serious water shortage in this community in a drought. What we have found is that we don't really have an alternative. And as we began to look at desal, we found that we can solve some of the most common problems of desalination. Often people talk about the problem of um, uh, salty brine going back into the bay. We have a solution that will mix fresh water from our uh, sewer outflow, treated water from the sewer outflow, so that we'll put the water back in the bay at the same level of salinity as we took it out of the bay in the first place. On the issue of harming fish, we have a slow water intake that's going to allow us to not have any significant impact on fish or even microscopic sea life, much less uh, our friendly otters that are out there in the bay. The City Water Department um, has already been developing alternative energy solutions to the problems that we face. And I just have to say, it, uh, the uh, desal uses a lot of energy, but just to get a sense of the scale of it, if we distribute the energy cost of a desalination plant to all of the businesses and houses in the city, they would have to increase their use by about 1% over what they do now. It's not a huge increase in terms of the amount of energy that people use in their homes. It's about leaving your computer on for about an hour to three hours a day is the amount that would be actually used by this plant. Now I want to turn this over to uh, Toby, who's going to talk a little bit more about some conservation issues we've been working on. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of everyone who works in the Water Department, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for the opportunity to discuss our community's water future. Our mission in the Water Department is to provide a safe, adequate, reliable supply of water to meet the various needs in the community. That's residents, business, industry. That's for our backyards, our gardens, our landscapes. It's for fire protection and for sanitation. It's one of the most important functions the city of government has and one that's vital to the health and safety and welfare of all the residents and to the quality of life to the public that we serve. Let's talk about our daily use for a minute. Each and every one of us in this room uses on average about 60 gallons of water today indoors and out. Some use less, some do more. Add to that amount of water that that goes to the businesses, to restaurants, motels, shopping centers, offices, churches, libraries, and that amount of water goes up to about 100 gallons per person per day, on average. Now take that 100 gallons and multiply it by 100,000 people, and you have an average daily demand in our community of 10 million gallons per day. It goes up in the summer, goes down in the winter. But just think about that, 10 million gallons every day, day in, day out. Now let's multiply that by 365 and you get an annual water need in this community of about 3.6 billion gallons per year. Our challenge, and that's the same challenge that Soquel Creek Water District faces, is how to best balance the available supplies with our demands, both now and into the future. We don't have the luxury just to bumble along day to day. We have to think long term and plan well ahead into the future. We also have a legal responsibility as a water utility 
to prepare for emergencies and to protect the community from endangerment due to natural disasters. Mike talked a little bit about where we get our water from, that we have surface water supplies, that we're dependent, we're also isolated physically and geographically. There's nowhere else that we can turn to to get additional water in a drought. Now our options we're gonna talk about tonight, I'm gonna uh, finish this up, but basically say our options in the city of Santa Cruz rely heavily on water conservation and curtailment, but conservation alone won't solve this problem. Our situation is just too difficult to overcome with conservation and curtailment alone. And we appreciate your interest in coming tonight to hear this story. Thank you. Thank you to Mike and Toby of SCWD2. That concludes the opening statement section of our evening. We'll now begin the section, second section of the event where teams will have two minutes each to respond to three questions that were prepared and provided in advance by the other team. The team who provided the question will have one minute to rebut the answer, and the answering team will also have one minute to respond to the battle. So it's gonna start to be like a tennis match. Hopefully we can all track that. Audience, you may continue to submit questions um, in writing during this section of the event. We'll start with question one. This question uh, is for desal alternatives from SCWD2. Our local elected officials are charged with analyzing the proposed desalination project at every step of the process and making certain that their constituencies are being well served by that process. Explain why you do not trust the CEQA process and have asked that this thorough environmental evaluation be halted, even though it will be used to inform elected officials and the community of both the benefits and challenges of this option, as well as alternatives. You have two minutes. Well, we've asked uh, the City Council put a hold on approving any more money for the desal plant, but it's not because we don't trust the CEQA process. It's because the original assumptions that led to the plan for desalination have been proven inaccurate or out of date there's a need to reconsider the desal project given the new information. The assumptions from the integrated water plan include water demand, that it dropped in according to the chart you just saw by 35% from the projected figure. Water supply is going to drop by an unknown amount due to habitat needs of endangered fish. Cost, cost projections for the plant were in 2003 were 32 million, we've already talked about a figure of 130 million now. Uh, the environmental impact, the EIR that examined the desalination in 2005 didn't mention it. It's, it had uh, how many pages? 600 and some pages didn't mention the word greenhouse gases once in the, in the entire document. And the other thing that's changed is the alternatives. Bentley, Jan Bentley will talk in a minute about the water exchange with SoCal District. Uh, that was on the table until it got X'd off uh, as a possible alternative because of uh, concerns that the city would be uh, losing water rights. Uh, when it reopens water rights negotiations, it would have something to lose. But right now the city is involved in water rights negotiations with the National Marine Fisheries Service. So we believe that option should come back on the table. Um, in order for the, that water exchange to take place, the fisheries agencies will have to agree to it. And that's why most recently we've asked the city council to give our water department direction that they discuss the water exchange with SoCal District in those habitat negotiations. And so far they haven't brought it up in those negotiations. This um, argument about the exchange, which will come up again with SoCal Creek, is the classic example of what I was talking about when I said I don't want the city to depend on something that might work or might not. SoCal Creek has spent millions of dollars and lots of consultants to study their uh, adequate, safe annual supply, and they still don't really know how much water's there. There's a water right issues about how the city would be able to ship water to SoCal Creek, but we have absolutely no information about whether SoCal Creek would be ever in a position to ship water back in our direction. It, it might be fine to complete the environmental impact report if it gave us um, more information about something we don't already know, but we know the energy costs already. Um, and that should be enough to give us pause. Uh, if the council decides to put this project on hold, they could save millions of dollars. According to the city's water supply assessment in 2009, the current estimated cost for design, permitting, and other related pre-construction expenses between 2009-2012 is 15.5 million pre-construction. And that doesn't count the pilot treatment plant, the money that was spent on that. We're spending millions of dollars each year on studies design and environmental review, but only half a million dollars on conservation. We want to double the conservation budget and make Toby a, a bigger manager there. 
Um, our request of the City Council is this. If you view desalination as a last resort, please adjust your spending priorities to reflect that. Question two. This question is for SCWD2 from Desal Alternatives. Cost comparison, desal versus conservation. What is the estimated cost of desalination per million gallons of water compared to one, current water production costs, and two, the cost of water saved through conservation measures such as toilet rebates? You have two minutes. I think in general everyone acknowledges that in most cases water saved through conservation is going to be cheaper on a unit basis than developing new sources. We don't have any argument with that. That's exactly why the city's policy in managing its resources is to promote water use efficiency to the maximum extent possible. You know, our approach to water conservation consists of recognized best management practices uh, that are balanced between appropriate regulations, plumbing codes, incentives, pricing, distributing devices, and education. In doing so, we have targeted systematically every major sector, residential, commercial, landscape, for both new and existing customers. And let me give an example of that. The city has a large landscape water budget program that has 11 million square feet approaching 200 millions of gallons of water under active management, which encompasses almost the entire sector. Now, desal alternatives would have you believe that with just rain barrels and composting toilets, there would be no need for desalination, and that we can just save our way out of this problem, and that's totally unrealistic. First, it's popular these days, granted, the water department sells them. We sell rain barrels. But in our kind of climate where it doesn't rain for seven months and the size of rain barrels that are available for the typical urban lot, it doesn't take us very far. When it comes to composting toilets, look, this is going to be replayed on family television. So I'm going to spare some details. But the city literally could spend $80 million to buy everyone in the town a composting toilet. And we probably not have a single taker, well, maybe one. And uh, just like I said before, successful programs have to be widespread appeal and be socially acceptable to be effective. Our shortages is much, thank you, I'll stop there. We're gonna say over and over again tonight how commendable um, Toby's conservation program is. But one thing I wanna point out here is that the IWP said the water department will actively consider new ideas as they arise, and will continue to, to encourage public involvement in this area. But the city doesn't seem very open to this. Additional conservation programs for large commercial and industrial customers were analyzed for the IWP, but the committee recommended against the idea of including them in the program. These things would have done the following. Weather-based irrigation controllers for large landscapers, expansion of the clothes washer program to include leased equipment, and a commercial toilet and urinal replacement program. We believe it's time to pull out the stops and consider all forms of conservation to make this thing work better. We actually do have a commercial clothes washer program, and we have a lot of commercial activity. We've um, worked with the university extensively to bring down their water consumption, as I think everyone knows. Um, we have participated with the state of California in an industrial and commercial conservation program. And contrary to what our opponents say, we do welcome ideas and embrace new opportunities as they come along. I'll give you an example. Ecology Action was involved with getting an energy grant to put uh, pre-rinse spray nozzles, the things in commercial dish rooms, and we worked with 95% of area restaurants to replace old water and energy guzzling pre-rinse sprays nozzles, and so the entire community is now has efficient equipment in their dish rooms. That's one example of the way we've done our work. This question is for desal alternatives from SCWD2. Without a supplemental water supply, an extended drought could force severe curtailments of water deliveries in excess of 30% and could place a tremendous burden on all residents, businesses, and especially visitors serving businesses. It would also place endangered fish at risk because there would be less water in local streams. How would your alternative plan protect the local economy, local jobs, and the environment from the impacts of an extended drought? You have two minutes. Our plan will provide 840 million gallons of drought year supply 
to protect the local economy. 300 million gallons will come from doubling the city's conservation effort. 360 million gallons will be reserved in Loch Lomond every year through curtailment. 180 million gallons will come from a water exchange agreement with Soquel. And we will maintain a balance between our water supply and growth through water neutral development. Conservation is the only city program that has done anything to increase our available water supply and it has been commendable. For the cost of desalination, we could double conservation's budget for 50 years. Conservation's incentives will spur job growth through plumbing retrofits, landscape retrofits, and water saving projects such as gray water and water, rainwater recycling. The city's plan does nothing to reserve water in Loch Lomond, ours does. The hardest thing about the curtailment levels we are asking for is that landscape irrigation will re be restricted to designated days and times. Our community achieved this level of curtailment in 2009 with no apparent impact to businesses or our quality of life. Exchanging water with Soquel can be done. Santa Cruz has ex excess winter supply that could be used to help Soquel, and this in turn would put them in better position to help Santa Cruz in dry years. Their, call, their plan calls for operating the desal plant all winter long while streams are flowing and rain is falling. This seems unreasonable, and we need to exhaust our pursuit of available resources before committing to such an extreme measure. Our plan will also improve flow in the local streams, but without the power-hungry carbon footprint of desalination. I'd like to take up the point of restricting citywide water use every summer to save water in the lake. Now, we did this effectively in 2009, and the reason we did it effectively is because everyone had belief and understood and comprehended the reason that we were actually in a real water shortage and took actions, therefore. Um, you know, it's not permissible under the law to just go out and, and mandate certain uh, restrictions. A governing board has to find that a shortage is in place to make, the, make that power come to be. And, and the other question I would raise is, do we really want to live in a community where we're surrounded by, as we had to do in 2009, water police going around and looking basically for people overwatering or watering on different days. Um, and so I would just ask if that's the kind of community we, we want to live in, um, that's my response. The question says that an extended drought could force curtailments of over 30%. Assuming that is accurate, what kind of water rationing would happen? The city's Water Shortage Contingency Plan of 2009 says that a stage four drought requiring curtailments of 35% would impose rationing on single family households of 216 gallons per day. As this chart indicates, in 2009, 70% of single family households used less than that. And another 20% of customers came close to using that amount. So in 2009, we weren't too far from achieving that goal. How about businesses? In a stage four drought, the city plans to cut water to businesses by 15%. We believe that a far greater threat to our local economy is the reduction in purchasing power of our citizens paying more and more for rising energy and maintenance costs of a desalination plant. This question is for SEWD2 from Desal Alternatives. Water neutral development policy. Would you agree that growth in water demand reduces our drought protection? So Creek District already has a successful water demand offset program that results in zero growth in water demand. Should Santa Cruz adopt such a policy? You have two minutes. Let me be clear here. The fact is the city is using less water today than it was in the early 1970s over 40 years ago. Growth in water demand is a problem that the city currently doesn't face. Now, several years ago, I wrote a report for the City Council in response to a state law that looked to better understand the relationship between land use and water supply in the city service area. And the question in that report was not whether the city had a real water shortage problem. It does. The question in that report was at what point the system might be fully subscribed. And one reason that we've been able to manage demand is because the city has such a policy. It has for many years. When someone comes down to the engineering counter to buy a water meter to build their home, they pay money into a fund that goes exactly 
as uh, our opponents are suggesting, to retrofit other properties so that there is no net increase in the overall change in water demand. But that's not the point here. The issue is they want you to think that the abstract idea of a water neutral policy would somehow eliminate the need for a supplemental water supply, that if the city somehow just had the same system in place as Soquel Creek, that we wouldn't need an additional source of water protection, of water for drought protection. That's simply not true. For one, just the notion that the city's water shortage problem is somehow caused by growth is wrong. What happens is when it doesn't rain, our stream sources drop off. That's our problem, is the lack of adequate water supply in a drought. So this is just really nothing more than a fear tactic. If this were truly an alternative, and let me ask you this question, if this were truly an alternative, SoCal Creek has that policy in place, why would they be partnering us with us to build a desal plant? If this were really successful, the district wouldn't need it, but it does. The policy about keeping reservoir levels high that I talked about in the opening presentation doesn't work if growth in water demand is allowed to continue. Right now we're averaging 580 gall million gallons of, of reservoir water every year over the last 10 years. The Water Department's plan is to allow growth to consume up to a billion gallons of water every year from Loch Lomond. That leaves us 200 million gallons in a second year of a worst case drought. So right when we need the water the most, we don't have it. So we're, we're I want to show you this chart. These dots represent the rise in water demand that the this, the, this is the latest figures from the City of Santa Cruz Water Department. They're planning for water demand to increase. What we're saying, a water neutral development policy means this bottom line here. Water demand does not increase. Water demand in Soquel Creek District has not increased since 2003 when they established the water neutral development policy. And the city water demand has not increased since 1976 when we began developing our policy. Both of these districts are approaching their water restrictions in slightly different ways with about equally effective result in terms of conservation. You have to remember again that we live in a city in an area that is using about half the water that's going on average in the state per capita. When we ask people in a serious drought to cut back, they tend to pay attention. Most people follow it. They understand we really are having a drought. They've got to deal with it. We did have to find over 200 people who didn't seem to get the message, but most people followed the rules. But the problem that we've got is not about demand growth. Remember those scary things I was saying earlier about what happens inside your house, where you don't have water to flush the toilet all the time, where you don't, there is not enough water to keep your gardens in Santa Cruz, you're going to let them all die. That would happen the next drought that we have. And the, our opponents want us to basically stop planning for water futures on the basis that somehow it's all going to work itself out and we won't have this crisis before we solve the problem. That's not right. This question is for desal alternatives from SCWD2. Many of the, the alternatives you suggest have already been studied over the past 20 years and found to be technically infeasible. The preferred alternative from the IRW, IRP IWP includes conservation, curtailment, and desalination. What facts support your argument against desal as a supplementary water supply? What proof do you have that conservation and a water transfer between Santa Cruz and SoCal would meet the objective of a guaranteed, reliable source of water for these two agencies? You have two minutes. Conservation and curtailment saves water. Conservation managers for Santa Cruz and SoCal have proven that. If their work is prioritized by their respective agencies and adequately funded, we see no reason why they couldn't double their success. Transferring water between the agencies is not a new idea. In the year 2000, the Alternative Water Supply Study recognized that Santa Cruz has unused winter supply that could supplement SoCal in normal rainfall years and would provide Santa Cruz 600 million gallons in dry years. Over the past 10 years, from December through April, Santa Cruz's average unused supply from the San Lorenzo River was 634 million gallons. This water goes unused because one, the city has no demand for it, and two, the city doesn't have the pretreatment equipment necessary to take advantage of it when storms make it turbid. The 2000 Alternative Supply Study recommended the pretreatment equipment saying 
The infrastructure improvements would provide water supply building blocks and would improve the overall system and reliability in both non-drought and drought years. Unfortunately, the IWP committee deemed this improvement insignificant and it was rejected from further study in the integrated water plan. This is a resource that would cost far less to produce and have far less environmental impact than desalination and we think our partnership with SoCal would be better served if they invested in this and not desalination. We've heard quite a bit tonight about this water swap and again, uh, John Ricker, who's the county's person who takes the lead on this and is one of the major proponents of this, um, and it's an idea that we think we should study. We're not against looking into it, but he says you cannot depend upon this as an alternative to a new water supply for the city of, of Santa Cruz. Once again, we're not arguing that there's not excess water running down the San Lorenzo. If you got water rights to use it, you could ship it to Soquel Creek. But there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Soquel Creek would ever be in a position to ship water back to Santa Cruz. A swap requires two partners. So it's not going to solve the city of Santa Cruz's water problem that we might be able to ship water to Soquel Creek when we don't know at all about how much safe supply they've got and the idea that you're going to recharge the water in the ground and that it's going to actually stay there and be able to use it during an extended drought, there's absolutely no evidence for it. So this is an example of an interesting idea that deserves further study. You will not solve our short-term drought uh, risk, which could be happening to us the next time we have a drought in a year or two or three years from now. I have prepared statements, but you don't have to digress from those, I think. One of the things we're trying to point out here is there is that water, the water is there. And we don't look at this as, you know, our problem versus their problem. We look at this as a, at a, as a regional problem, a problem that can be solved between the two communities. And even if SoCal can't give us water back, we think they should access that water because it's not going to go to any other use anyways unless something like that is done. We're suggesting that SoCal curtail their use of water at the same time that we do, or that we're asked to in the drought years, in the dry years. At my estimate, at about 15% curtailment, they could return to us 180 million gallons that they saved. They have no plans to curtail right now. They don't have to. They think their water supply is adequate enough that they don't enforce curtailment. We're just saying, work out a plan where we can give you this excess water, and you can curtail and give us some back. This question is for SCWD2 from Desal Alternatives. Water exchanges between districts. Do you support the strategy of Santa Cruz sending stream or river water to SoCal District in normal winters and SoCal District sending well water to Santa Cruz during droughts? If so, when do you plan on applying for the necessary state permits and when do you plan on requesting funds for planning, review, and design of this project? You have two minutes. I'm sure by now the audience is sick of this one particular way of looking at what we, how we might solve our problem. This is back again to the idea of a water exchange between SoCal Creek and the city of Santa Cruz. We're in favor of a regional solution. The desalination plant that we're proposing to study further during this next, this next year is a regional solution to a problem. But again, it's different if you're a critic, if you're a, uh, somebody out there in the community that has some ideas about how we might want to look into alternatives. We're not opposed to that. We, we believe we should study those issues. If you're the water department for Soquel Creek residents and businesses or the city of Santa Cruz, you have an obligation to make sure that when you have a severe drought, you actually can provide people with water. That we don't want to live in a town that's going to be paved over and doesn't have gardens outside, or where people are facing sanitation problems and businesses are going under because they're forced to curtail a level that will not be sustainable. And we studied this issue. It's not just a thought in somebody's head. And in this situation, it's not responsible. Again, I'm not on the city council anymore. It would not be responsible if my representatives on the city council or the people who live in Soquel's representatives on Soquel Creek decided they would go on a fly and see if maybe there's some way that Soquel could eventually ship water back towards Santa Cruz. That's irresponsible planning. We are mixing together conservation. We're already at half the state level, serious curtailment in the event of a drought, and we're still short a significant amount of water. We, our solution is not to supply all the water in Santa Cruz with a desal plant. It's a marginal amount of water that we're talking about. It's, not, it's a small little slice of what the water that has to happen. But it's an important one because if you have a severe drought and you don't have an additional supply and we've studied all these other alternatives and they don't work, we're going to be in a bad situation 
And I can assure you that there'll be recall movements against the city council members. I'll probably be leading one because they didn't solve this problem in, the, in enough time to not leave us in a crisis when the drought actually hit. I totally agree that this is a, it should be a combination of solutions. And that's all we're asking as to how our alternatives heard. But for example, you could util the city could utilize the entire San Lorenzo right that they have right now to serve their customers in the winter if it was treatable. And then they could use the coastal sources, which are pre-1914 rights, which don't require any permit changes to allow them to send out water to Soquel. Yes, they do require Fish and Games Agreement. Once again, it seems like the perfect time to discuss this with Fish and Games since we've been sitting at the table with them for the last nine years. So all we're saying is let's get all, this, all these possibilities on the table. And if we don't start now, the city keeps saying it's going to take 20 years to get the water rights changed. State codes 109 and 475 favor voluntary water transfers, so the state's in favor of that. All we need to do is work this out with Fish and Game, and we could be on our way. The opportunity is now. It's an interesting time to suggest that we take additional water out of our streams when the federal government is about to mandate, require, that we give up another 800 million gallons a year from the San Lorenzo River and the two North Coast streams. I suppose anything's possible, but honestly, if you want your agency to be responsible about dealing with drought conditions, you don't develop an alternative solution that doesn't address the fact that that's not realistic. You're, we're going to be asked to use less water from those streams, not more. Yes, in certain times in the winter, there's lots of water running out to the sea. As was pointed out earlier, sometimes you can't use it because it's too turbid. But that by itself does not give you the water when you need it which is in the summertime. We don't have droughts in Santa Cruz in the wintertime. We have them in the summer. And when those droughts happen, and we've, got, we've conserved as much as we do, and it's a great deal, and we've curtailed, our, asked our customers to give up even more at a level that we've studied that we could do in a safe way, and then you don't have that last little bit that you need to avoid a real serious crisis in terms of sanitation and business failure, that would be a mistake. Thank you to both teams for responding to each other's questions. And this concludes the prepared question section of the debate. So the teams will now respond to questions from the audience that have been presented to us by the committee. Each team will have one minute to respond to each question presented, unless otherwise indicated by myself at the recommendation of the committee. A team may decline to respond to a question, and we will rotate whichever team responds first um, whenever possible. There won't be an opportunity to clarify meaning of questions or inquire as to intent from the audience, so please just answer the questions as best as you're able and there will be no opportunity to rebut the other team's response. So the first question is for team one, uh, which is desal alternatives. If streams are now too dry to support fish and you're advocating not using the lake, are you imagining the community will ration every year to support fish and how can you describe how that works? I just wanna be clear uh, after Mike's last comment that um, the fisheries agencies would need to sign off on the idea of the water exchange if, if there's a, a threat to the fishery, the fish habitat by sending water to, to SoCal District, the fisheries agencies know about it. And they would, you know, they've already given us some favorable uh, response to this idea because we're talking about winter water when the flow in the river is a thousand times what it is in the summer. So uh, in terms of uh, getting water back from SoCal District, I don't, I'm not sure that everybody understood what Jen Bentley said. We're talking about an agreement between the two districts such that when we're in a drought, Soquel District matches our drought curtailment. Instead of keep pumping their aquifer at the same rate that they usually do and consuming all of that, they pump at the same rate that they usually do, but they give us the percentage that we're curtailing, that both districts are curtailing. That's something we can work out if we have workable relationships. We're putting our faith in relationships and not in high-tech I've almost lost track of the question because I don't think they responded to it whatsoever. I, the question, if I understood it, was about um, how would it work if you're forced to like conserve all the time? Yes. And, and Are you imagining the community will ration every year to support fish, and how can you describe how that works? Yeah, and again, our understanding is that the people of Santa Cruz are already being very responsible about their water use. I mean, we are at half the state average. And the idea that you've got, we've been able to get people to do that successfully by a number of programs the city and SoCal Creek operate is great. 
But at some point, you have a marginal return. You can start to pay people to take out their lawns. You can start, there's all kinds of things that you can do. But the question would be, how many people are likely to do that? We, we set up a program where we've got people uh, using, the um, city will sell you a tank to put in your yard to water. But the problem in Santa Cruz is we're not the East Coast. After the end of May, you use your tank once, and now you've got seven months until you have to, going to have some new water. So I don't know how people would find their way around not having water to do the kind of things that we enjoy in this community. We're a green community, and we, that takes water outdoors and in to make that happen. Thank you. We'll now move on to a question directed at SCWD2, so you'll answer first. Mike says that opponents will emphasize growth issues and the problem already exists, so this isn't really relevant. Nonetheless, how can you justify uh, broking or backering 152 million gallons to UCSC before the desal plant you want is built? Doesn't that put existing customers at risk? Question of how much water the university will use in the future is one that has uh, been debated heavily in this community. But the record of the university of the past 20 years has been one of tremendous responsibility. The university has more than doubled its enrollment and maintained almost a static level of water use. Now as a water agency, we have to look into the future and raise the question, how much water would the university need given its enrollment projections and what it's planning in the way of physical development of a campus? But that doesn't mean that actually will come to pass. And most of the excitement about the university water use is really hyperbole about what might happen, not what actually is happen. I would look at folks to ask the question, how well has the university done? And they've done a very, very responsible job, outstanding job in terms of conserving water. PG&E and other utilities learned uh, a while ago that when demand is increasing, that it's much more profitable to invite people to conserve than building a new Diablo Canyon plant. It's hugely expensive and they, their profit margin just goes down when they do that. So it's time we learn that as a city. You know, we have examples from Australia in which, you know, they've gotten down to 40 gallons per person per day. And you know how they did it? They give people shower timers, little things that you put in your shower, it's in a little hourglass, a four minute shower timer. Can we survive on four minute showers? I think the hyperbole is coming from the idea that we weren't not gonna have enough water to flush our toilets. The stage four drought, as I showed you in this graph, is 216 gallons for a family of four per day. You know, our family, we have a family of four, we don't use anywhere near that and we never have. And that's, we're underneath the drought level curtailment. Thank you. We have a question for both teams, which I'll have Desal Alternatives answer first. Shouldn't this decision be made by the voters? Why are we not voting on this issue? Desal Alternatives, you have one minute. I, I, I agree. Um, I guess the way I would respond to that comment or question is basically to asked the city of Santa Cruz, and they've said to us that they, they have conceded that desalination is not a done deal. So with that said, what would their backup plan be if desal doesn't happen, which by you know, vote of the public, it might not happen. So I would just ask what their backup plan is. They haven't offered one. The question of a vote of the people in Santa Cruz is a non-issue because if the city council doesn't do something the people in this town want to have happen, it will happen. So it's not that there's any way the city council could block that vote or not allow it to happen. I think the issue for the public in town is can they get information to understand what their real choice is? And you also want to be careful about what you wish for. I'm not on the council anymore, but I can imagine the city council phrasing the question in a way, uh, would you like to have uh, no desal plant, uh, a desal plant or not have a desal plant? And would you like to have these kinds of conditions without your desal plant? You can load questions up before the public and votes. I'd like to depend on the people of the city of Santa Cruz. If they feel that there's something coming down the pike that they don't like, we have shown over and over again, and I've been a part of that, that we can get anything on the ballot that we want to and stop anything the council's doing that we think doesn't make sense. So I want to have a public education process so we have informed voters if this, in fact, goes to the voters at some point. We have a question for SCWD2, so they'll start. 
what are the water quality differences between desal and current water sources? If there are major differences, how will this affect our health, landscape, et cetera? SCWD2, you have one minute to respond. We did a study with a pilot plant that was about a ten, one tenth the size of what the eventual plant is likely to be. There are no significant differences in the quality of water that comes from desalination versus the other ways we get it now. Uh, water would have to be treated. Uh, it goes through a reverse osmosis process through a membrane, and it comes out basically, you know, relatively pure water. Right now, we have to put our water at the, sewer, at the uh, water treatment plant through also filtering to make that happen. So there's no significant difference. There have been a number of tests around the state in which uh, people were unable to tell which water was desal, which water came from which city, and so forth. So there's no reason to think that there's going to be a difference in quality from the water that we get out of a desal plant versus what we get out of either Loch Lomond, San Lorenzo River, or the North, North Coast streams. I would I would add to that that the department is subject to state health standards and we have to meet all federal and state drinking water standards every day, 365 days a year, and we do. I'm certified by the state of California to operate water treatment plants. I'm certified at the highest level possible, but I wouldn't begin to discuss this here right now. That's up to the city water department, the, the experts there, the water quality department. They'll make sure that your water is safe. And desal is safe water. It's not the same kind of water that you get from your surface sources. It, it comes out of the desal plant very acidic, and you'll need to treat it just to prepare it to come back into the water system so it doesn't destroy the water system that it's going into. So there's a lot of differences. But here, once again, the city will take care of us. Beyond that, there are differences in where that water comes from that you won't experience the same problems as you might find um, you know, in surface sources, you won't experience the same uh, problems. And that has to do with the, the, um, the, uh, the biology of the ocean. So you know, we don't really know. We're, we're going to be on the cutting edge of this, and so it's going to be something to keep your eye on. We have a question for desal alternatives, so they will go first. Water neutral development is a temporary solution. Retrofits are limited. What will replace this program when it is no longer functional? Yeah, it's true. We're, we're going to run out of toilets to replace. Uh, when we run out of toilets, we'll go to replacing landscaping. Uh, when we run out of landscapes to replace, you know, we can play, replace clothes washers. Eventually, we're going to get to the point where we're pretty darn efficient, and it's going to cost developers so much money to try to get that water neutrality offset that they're going to design buildings such as the one you saw on the slide that consumes 16 gallons a day. We're, what we're talking about is living within our limits. This is, you know, this is so true over a course of, of you know, so many different areas of life. But, you know, we, nature has limits and, and we need to figure out how to live within them. A major point in our uh, opponent's argument is that basically people can serve a great deal more than they do now. And they mentioned Western Australia. It's actually Western Australia they're talking about. It's true, the people of Western Australia have been getting along with a lot less water than we use here. And the people of Western Australia are building desal plants like crazy. They're building a, a water access that looks like the California aqueduct to bring them water, transfer water tra uh, from other places. Um, at a certain point, you can make changes in people's lifestyle that don't affect them negatively. It's, when you learn to use drip irrigation rather than sprinklers, that doesn't destroy the quality of your garden and your life or anything else. At some point, you start to use, cut off the amount of water you have, you start to have sanitation problems and businesses start to fail. We studied this question and this, this last little margin that we cannot get out of conservation in the foreseeable future that's driven us to look at desal as a serious alternative. We'll study its positive and negative impacts and other alternatives before we implement it, but we need to look for a, a water supply to meet our shortage. Conservation alone cannot do it. Mr. Rotkin, as a past city council member, how can you rationalize spending millions of taxpayer dollars to propagandize desal, consultants, PR firms, advertising, when the infrastructure of water supply is severely neglected? It's really critical that the people in the city of Santa Cruz have full information about the things that we're considering. When somebody uses the word propaganda, what I would expect to find are lies, distortions, graphs that put things out of context or that make things look wrong. That's not the kind of thing that people are getting from the city of Santa Cruz. We're trying to provide them with sufficient information, to, and Soquel Creek's doing the same thing, sufficient information to understand what the real choice is in some way. And I think if you want to engage the citizens in a democratic process, which is something I've always believed in, you've got to give them information. It can't be based on their emotions. Emotionally, I'm opposed to desal. 
Now that I've spent 30 years trying to fight it, appointing people to the Water Commission who were against it, and I just, when I appointed them, I said, if you can't come up with an alternative, then you have to be rational and start to look at what the alternatives are. And if desal is all that's left, I'm only going to appoint you if you'll look at that as a serious choice. But I want you to fight desal all the way. You reach, we've reached the point where we really don't have a clear alternative, and the public needs to know that information and understand what their real choices are. I, I really want to respond to one thing before we end tonight, and that's the idea that we're already doing so much conservation that we really can't do more on a regular basis, and that our ability to cut back in drought is limited because we, can, you know, we can't put bricks in toilet tanks anymore. This is called demand hardening in the industry, and on the face of it, it, it sounds logical. But what does the research say about demand hardening? In 2001, the city commissioned a consultant, Gary Fisk, to do a water curtailment study. In that study, Fisk wrote a review of the literature on demand hardening. He writes, quote, evidence of demand hardening is largely anecdotal. If anything, the liter literature suggests that demand hardening is la largely a hypothetical issue. He goes on to say, quote, survey research suggests those making investments in long-term conservation also have the highest likelihood to reducing their demands during shortages, end quote. And this has been confirmed by evidence from Australia more recently. Evidence from Australia says that a lot of the ability to people to cut back during droughts depends on their confidence that they're getting the straight story from their water agency. What happens to the amount of water available from Loch Lomond if we have two or more severe droughts in a row, three or more years, et cetera? It's unprecedented, three, three years in a row. We've had three or four years in a row that were uh, from 80, 88, 87, 89. Those were, that was a four year of uh, dry years. It wasn't a critical drought like it was in 77, 76, 75, 76, 77. If we have three years that way, yeah, it would be, it would be um, drastic. I don't think the city's even preparing for that. However, we still believe that we don't start the summer with the reservoir at 60%. We start the summers with the reservoirs, or we end the summers at 60%, not, or at 80 or 80% 80 or so, not 60% like the city's suggesting. So that way you go into the next year with the 360, with the 400 million gallons of water that you're gonna need to get you through that next summer. And that's about all you can do. Just to add to that, the city does um, have a policy where they keep a billion gallons in the lake even after throughout year two. My first son was born in 1987, and he was six years old before he saw a decent storm. We've had a six-year drought just in our recent memory in this generation. And it was in 1990 that the governor made emergency action asking every water agency in the state to give us their three-year worst-case plan because we were three years into it and we were facing a terrible situation. And it was only because of one lucky month in March that we came out of that and we had a couple more dry years. Our lake is designed to help us get through summers. We use it to balance the difference between what the rivers will give us and what our demand is in the summer. The lake is not designed for a three, four, six, or 10 year drought like the Australians had. It simply wasn't designed for that purpose and it won't be enough. In the period prior to electric power, water distribution systems, Santa Cruz citizens' average use of water per day was less than 20 gallons. What entitles us to more now? I, I'm not sure what entitles us to more, but that is uh, where we live now. We're not talking about going back to the 20s or sometime before there was PG&E. Does anyone rationally think that we're gonna cut off the lights and cut people back to 20 gallons per day? And that's the kind of community that we want to live in Really, I don't think that's a, a viable choice for this community going forward. You know, I'd like to back up here. You know, when we're talking about putting out more greenhouse gas emissions, even if it's only an additional 1% of our total electricity use, it's going in the wrong direction. You know, we, we, I taught middle school for a little while, and those kids surprised me because I thought I grew up in the era of the bomb when, you know, we were worried. Those kids don't really have a lot of hope. And they had less hope than I did when I was a kid. We, we need to show by our example that we're going in the right direction. You know? So if it's a trade-off between the needs of today and the needs of our grandchildren, come on. We, we know, what we, we, know we, want, we care about our grandchildren. 
So if it's health and safety, maybe, you know, if we're talking about typhoid and, you know, not being able to flush toilets, maybe let's look at it. But if it's about keeping our lawns green, you know, then, then, then there's no contest. This will be our last prepared question and is worthy of a much longer discussion, but we'd like to um, ensure we touch on it this evening. Um, if both teams, starting with desal alternatives, might address what are the marine impacts for desalination? There's impacts on the way in and the way out. On the way in, there's a two, uh, two millimeter screen. Anything smaller than two millimeters gets sucked into the plant and dies. That includes fish larvae, that includes fish eggs, and it includes plankton, okay? The study that's already been done says, yes, there is an impact, but it's not significant. On the way out, the discharge. On the discharge of the brine will include coagulants, antiscalants, and biocides. And so far, there's not been a study on that. And as far as I know, nowhere in, this, in the country has there been a study on that. In addition, there are algae blooms that happen in Monterey Bay. Those algae cells get sucked into the plant. They will rupture under the super saline solution and they will discharge their toxins into the concentrated area where the discharge happens out in Monterey Bay. Shellfish and other filter feeders, we're going to feed on that. Anything that feeds on shellfish, you know anything that feeds on shellfish? It's going to have a problem. The question of water intake and impact on marine life is a serious issue in desal. It's one of the main reasons I was initially opposed to it. We've actually developed an intake system, and you can see a picture of it at work, the model of it at work on our website, that shows you that because it's such a, we're talking about building a very small plant, it's a slow water intake, and the, you can watch the video of the little pieces of debris in the water, really microscopic, small things you can just barely see, dri drifting by with the current and not even being sucked into the intake in this plant. Go, go on our website and take a look at that. It's, you really have to understand what's going on. There would be some loss of, of sea life uh, at this microscopic level, just to get a sense of the scale and the, in terms of the studies we've done already. Typically, we might lose the larvae that would lead to 50 fish in the Monterey Bay. Uh, I'm, this is a particular species I was looking at, which is a white fish, a white croaker. People fish 160,000 of these fish out of the bay every year. We might lose 50 of them because their larvae didn't get to like maturity. This is not a problem of our desal plant. The energy issue is more serious and needs to be addressed, but the question of sea life is not an issue for this plant. Thank you, teams, for responding to this wide range of excellent audience questions. We'd like to let the audience know that within a couple weeks, all of the submitted questions, and the teams actually as well, um, will be typing up those questions and providing them to both the teams for their use however they see fit. So all of your questions will be submitted to those agencies and organizations. Thank you. We'll now move on to closing statements. Each team has two minutes to provide their closing remarks, and we'll proceed in the worst, reverse order of the, as the opening statements. So SCWD2, you have two minutes for your closing remarks. On behalf of the City of Santa Cruz and the Soquel Creek Water District, we would like to thank the League of Women Voters for sponsoring tonight's valuable discussion. Benjamin Franklin said, when the well is dry, we'll know the worth of water. Clearly, people have different perspectives on how to solve our local water supply challenges. And waiting for the well to go dry, however, is no option. As a representative of the responsible local providers, water providers, let me leave you with the following three fundamental points. Number one, the purpose and need for a reliable supplemental water supply is very real. Water conservation and use curtailment during droughts are important in balancing supply and demand from both of our agencies, but it's not realistic to expect that they alone can solve the entire problem. Without a supplemental water source, the city will someday face a public health and safety crisis and an economic and environmental disaster. Point two, we're fortunate to have both agencies working together jointly to resolve our unique water challenges. Our chances of success are better working together as a region, and it helps lessen the financial burden on our own individual ratepayers. Point three, the environmental impact report now underway will provide a fair and thorough evaluation of the project's potential impacts and provide elected officials with the information they need to make an informed decision on this project. We encourage your involvement and welcome everyone's input in that important process. Thank you very much. It has been 10 years since the city made a commitment to desalination. On paper, it was a good solution. Since then, there has been a decade of green revolution, 
Energy saving is a common adjective used to describe just about everything. Now, in terms of the environment, desal would be considered backward thinking. It is time to recalculate our priorities and find a focus for solving our water supply needs. Tonight, we have just scratched the surface on, on this issue, and I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for providing, for providing the first opportunity for open debate. I have a little poem. It's called The End of the Frontier. Ever west they came from far and near till they reached this land, the end of the frontier, to this strange, lovely place where the tallest trees stand, where there's hardly any rain for half the year. When their children dammed the streams and drilled wells into the ground, did they ever dream that someday they'd be bound by nature's limits? As the salt migrated inland and the salmon didn't, it was tempting to believe we could bypass nature's limit with a techno fix, fossil fuel desalination. Our other choice was learn to live with better conservation. Well, it still doesn't rain for half the year, but that need not give us reason to fear. Life can be good at the end of the frontier. So with the closing remarks that mark the end of our debate this evening, um, there will be a wrap-up remarks by the League representatives, so hang on to your seats. I wanted to thank the League, um, as our speakers have, for the, both the honor of moderating this event, as well as hosting the event for the benefit of the community, and each of you in the audience for providing such excellent questions and respectful attention. I really, really would like to thank the presenters for the depth and courteousness of their participation this evening. <laughs> thank you. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Santa Cruz County, I wish to thank the participants at tonight's debate. We hope that the information presented here tonight will produce a greater understanding of the differing views on how best to balance water supply and demand. Thank you all for coming and good night.